Hi, I'm Brett Ryan, the CEO of Focus on the Family Australia, and welcome to the series about talking about sex. This is a topic that many people feel a little bit awkward about, a little bit uncomfortable, but thank you for being open to be informed so you can be more confident and more competent in talking to your kids about this topic. And my background does give me a little bit of experience of seeing uh, children in a variety of different settings, in the hospital setting and, uh, and then in the church setting, and now I work for Focus on the Family. So I help people physically when I was a nurse, I help people spiritually when I was a pastor, and now I help people relationally. And Focus on the Family, you may have heard us on the radio. Uh, our mission is to make Christ known as we strengthen relationships in Australian families, and we do that in a variety of ways. One of the things is obviously through the radio. Radio is our greatest reach. We're in about 750 radio stations across Australia, which gives us a significant reach. So you're never too sure who might be hearing and listening to us um, in their car or in their kitchen or wherever they may be. And it's such a privilege. And we do, uh, we've started a YouTube channel. We're doing Facebook Live events. We've got a, um, a, a website. It's got a wealth of different resources and are available to you. You can sign up for a newsletter, uh, either a weekly or a monthly newsletter. And we do a little bit of other training as well. And I've got a number of different resources uh, that I'd like to share with you in the sense of doing it verbally and through a PowerPoint that hopefully will address a lot of the questions when we're talking about this important topic about how to talk to your kids about sex. And right now, some people are going, oh man, this is the most embarrassing thing. It makes me feel uncomfortable. Can't I just wait until they're older? Well, I would encourage you to get out of your comfort zone and uh, in encourage you to lean in and I'll hopefully give you some strategies of how to talk about this and the reasons why, because the more confident you are, the more comfortable you are, the more easy it is to talk to your kids about this very important topic. Because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when your kids will be exposed to things, because we live in a very highly sexualized world, and we would encourage you to be as proactive as possible and not wait till it happens. I could give you some frightening statistics, um, but I won't bore you with all the numbers, but let's just say that your children, if they're about 12 years of age, I could almost guarantee by 100% that they will have been, been exposed to pornography. And so they're getting a different narrative of what sex is all about. And we know, and especially if you've got a faith, that there is an important thing about sex and how we communicate that. In a highly sexualized world, there are other people, other forces trying to get into your kids' worlds to actually make them conform to the patterns of this world. And I would encourage you that you have what we call the first voice privilege, and you need to maximize that voice, first voice privilege. And it's not just a one-off conversation. And it might have been that might have been your story, that you had the talk from your parents and you might have wriggled your way through it or, or you may have never had it or you may have suddenly found a book by your bedside table and you thought, wow, what's this all about? Or you may have never had that conversation, but don't let that be repeated with your kids. We need to talk to our kids much earlier and, and it's never too early to talk to your kids about the big issues in life and at an age appropriate level, because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when your kids will be exposed to something and your kids should feel comfortable to talk to you about anything and everything and you don't freak out. I'll repeat that, you don't freak out. So a little motto to remember is learn to respond, not react. Because when you react, it shuts the conversation up. But when you respond, you might be flipping out on the inside, but on the outside, you're doing very, very well. But we need God's help. For those who've got a faith, there's a great verse in Psalm where it says, without the help of the Lord, it is useless to build a home or to guard a city. It is useless to get up early and stay up late in order to earn a living. God takes care of his own even while they sleep. And we all could do with a little bit more sleep. But this is the thing. Children are a blessing and a gift from the Lord. God saw fit that you are the best stewards of your children. And we have to take that stewardship seriously. We have to do the very best that we can with what we've been given. And God's given us some wisdom and insights. We've given us our experiences. 
And we need to navigate this because our kids are going to be asking questions. And if we're not prepared to give an answer, they will go and look for it somewhere else. They'll either ask their peers, who've got a wealth of experience, obviously, or they'll turn to the internet, the Google. And we understand that the internet is not always uh, your best friend. There's about three major influences over your children. Family, which is vitally important, especially mum and dad, even though they might you know, say back off. We'll talk about that in a few moments. They're friends and friends become such a significant part of their influence. And then we have the media. And I would encourage you uh, to do as much research on all of these areas. But as I said, you have what we call first voice privilege. And as we do that, we need to be better informed. And at Focus, we have these three eyes: being informed, being involved, being intentional. And the more informed you are, the more comfortable, as you, I said, you are, and more confident you will be. Being involved is understanding and make, what makes your kid tick, and then being intentional. You know, it's the knowing doing gap, putting those things that you think you should do and putting it into practice. I mentioned it before is that your kids are growing up and obviously many of your children are in the primary age ages and you might have some older kids, but you might have some younger kids and you need to talk about these things as early as possible. Even when you're talking about, you know, the, the body parts and talking about being informed using the right terminology, the right name for genitalia, not making things up, it to be honest and open. And if you don't know the answer, don't make it up. I remember hearing a story of a father who was asked the question by his son at about the age of six or seven. And he says, Daddy, where did I come from? Well, the father said, oh, man, I didn't think I'd have to give this answer. Well, he proceeded to give the whole story of the birds and bees, which I have to say, I don't understand what they mean about birds and bees because birds and bees don't procre procreate. But that's another thing. But he proceeded to give the whole story and, and the kid's going, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah, oh, I don't, ah, oh, ah. Oh. And he says, do you have any questions? And he goes, no. And he says, well, why did you ask in the first place? And he says, well, Tom says he comes from Roeville and Sam says he comes from Narry Warren. I just want to really know where I come from. So it's always good to ask a question to find out what the reference is. So I think the good thing in the lesson, if you're going to go away from tonight, is actually to ask good questions. Why did you ask that? Where is that coming from? Not to overreact, but to respond accordingly at their age and maturity. Your kids are going to go under, undergo an enormous amount of changes. And, and we obviously know about puberty and the physical changes, the emotional, the psychological, and the relational changes. And they're going through a process called individuation. They're trying to say, where do I fit into the world? And they might start, you know, they might be perfect. And I had actually had a father recently contact me on the Day of his uh, daughter's 13th birthday, she had a period. The first day she had a period. And that was the day she completely changed. And they're ringing me up saying, what's happening? Our daughter was just lovely. And now she's just completely different. This is adolescence. This is puberty. And you might remember when you went through that and how much of a nightmare you might have been given to your parents or to your siblings. All of this is to say is that your child is going through this process of individuation. Back off, mum and dad. I've got this. I know this. But you don't want to back off too far. You want to maintain the relationship through all of this journey. They're going to be much more vulnerable to peer pressure, and there can be some positive peer pressure and also be obviously negative peer pressure. They're going to be persuaded and influenced by popular culture, and they're going to push the boundaries. They're going to take some risks. And I say all of this is that your child needs to have a narrative, especially when it comes to the big issues. These big issues include drugs and alcohol, which we won't be talking about today. We're going to be talking about sex. Technology and sex, unfortunately, go hand in hand. And, and we talk about media and the messages. Because your kids are going to be confronted with a situation and they're going to just say one of two things. It just happened or it will never happen to me. Those two things, they need to have a narrative when they're confronted with a situation. And I will start it off with, if your kids don't have a response because you haven't prepared them, they will be probably more persuaded with the popular culture or more persuaded by their peer pressure than their values and beliefs that you've set in your home. So I would love to encourage you to create and mold and shape your children to have 
a character that can be countercultural, to stand up for what they believe in, to stand out, stand up for their values and beliefs, and especially when it comes to sexuality. So the church in general, for those who are in a faith community, and I love how the schools are doing better at this, but parents need to do a better job. And a couple of things I have in mind is that sex is not a dirty word. And eventually, you might have been brought up with that. And, and many people I have spoken to, as they've got older, they've had that program, sex is wrong, sex is bad, sex is naughty. And they've actually had that program in their mind. So when they actually find their lifelong partner, get married, there's a tension because what they've heard about sex is not what it's designed to be. And so we need to talk about how wonderful sex is, that it's been created by God for a purpose, obviously by procreation, and it's for pleasure, but it's also, it shows that permanency and the commitment, and many people liken it to the triune relationship that we have with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit to be husband and wife and God, the Trinity. Bringing this together and actually saying that, that sex in marriage, the ideal setting for sex is a visible expression of who God is because he wants us to live life and life to its full. And it is a gift and we need to treat it reverently. And unfortunately, in our day and age, our culture has actually distorted what sex is all about. And they made it very cheap and very nasty, very available. And there's no necessarily a connection. You can be do things physically, but we've forgotten actually there's the relational and the emotional connection. Because our brain is a chemistry set, a wonderful thing designed by God, and it's releasing all these wonderful hormones, serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, which are bonding together when we are intimate with another person. And the church in the past and parents in the past have actually have not explained the why that sex should be weighted until they're married, in the confines of a covenantal relationship in marriage, where they actually just heard the message, don't get pregnant, don't get an STI. But we haven't explained the why. And in this day and age, our kids will ask the question time and time again, but why? And you need to be prepared to give an answer, a response that kids can actually understand. So what can parents do? I'm glad you asked. What can you do? Well, ideally, it would be great for mum and dad to be on the same page. And I know there'll be some people who are watching this who may be doing it solo. And in one, in fact, that can be an advantage because you don't have to compete with a different value system, a different belief systems. But my hat goes off to single parents. It is a hard enough job to do it together. But my hat goes off to you and keep up doing the great job. And I commend you significantly for what you're doing. But if you are doing it together, let's get mum and dad on the same page. And sometimes it might be that the guys will talk to the guys and the girls will talk to mum. But I also think it's really important that dad speaks to the girls and mum speaks to the guys. So they've got a different perspective. You need to start as early as possible and talking about, you know, what's private. And I remember hearing a story of a, um, a, a mother who was speaking to their daughter and uh, she's talked about private parts and the daughter misheard it and thought it was pirate parts and they couldn't understand why she was always talking about that's my pirate part um true story but anyway private and then there's things that are, are appropriate and not appropriate the language you say and share needs to be consistent and it's not just a one-off conversation it is an ongoing dialogue and we want to encourage our kids to ask questions, to be curious, to be inquisitive. But you also need to be curious with them. And as I said to you earlier, is asking questions. Where did you hear that? Because they might come up with some all different things they may have seen on the, on the TV, on a, a media platform, on YouTube, or they may have heard something at school. I remember my son heard something and he didn't understand what it was, so he Googled it but he was unfortunately at school. And then I think the SWAT team came in, the IT departments came in and you know, how dare you look at this? And he had no idea what he was looking up because he was quite naive. But we want our kids to be naive. We want them to stay as innocent as possible, but we can't keep them in a bubble. We need to talk to them about these things. 
Because, for example, your kids may be exposed to pornography and they're, they're worried that mum and dad will freak out. And my wife has given me permission to say this, that one of my boys we discovered was looking at pornography. And my wife freaked out. She was sobbing. She was in a fetal position. She was responded really badly. My son was already feeling guilty and feeling shame and, and feeling embarrassed about it. And my wife actually just laid another layer of that onto him. And I said to my wife, you can't, can't do this. And she said, I'm not mad at him. I'm just mad that someone's taken away his innocence because he was at a Christian school. We had parameters, we had actually put things around our household, we had spoken about these things, and a friend at school brought a smartphone, which I call a not-so-smartphone, brought it along and exposed him. And he, my wife was mad that his innocence had been compromised. And I said, he doesn't know that. So she proceeded to pro uh, apologize to him and said, and explain to him why she was feeling that and that she overreacted she learned to respond and she said, well, we'll navigate this together. And then we can actually help them because if we freak out, it means it shuts the conversation up and no one will actually talk about it. But we want to talk about that and help them navigate this. The challenge is, is how far do we go? And do we share our own skeletons? I get the question asked often. Do we have to share everything? No, it's at an age appropriate level and the level of their curiosity. Because I also spoke to one of my other sons and I said, how much do you want me to talk about? And he said, oh, this much. We have to push the envelope a little bit and give them some more information, probably a little bit more than they may want to hear. But we have to understand that if you don't share about it, someone else will. And you have a vested interest in their health and well-being. And you want to give them the values and beliefs that you believe will be the best for them and preparing them for the realities of this world. Unfortunately, kids will get shocked and all sorts of things. And they're going to go through the puberty. So I'll just briefly talk about puberty for a moment. Puberty is, is the internal and external change of their body. And it means they're going from childhood to adulthood. And we have to explain to them what's going to change. And for example, if you haven't spoken to your 10-year-old daughter about periods and menstruation, it's probably a little bit late because they may have their first period and they will freak out if you haven't had that conversation. If you haven't had that conversation about wet dreams to your son, that one day they may wake up and they're all moist in their bed. Now, it doesn't happen to everyone, but it could happen. But you need to prepare them. So if it does happen, they're not going to freak out. They're going to say, oh, mum and dad mentioned that to me. And it's a, also a great opportunity to teach them how to use the washing machine. <laughs> because if they learn how to, if, if it ever happens, just grab your sheets and put it in the washing machine and, and push the buttons and put the soap in. And great. It's a, it's, it's a win-win. But just to talk about these things, menstruation, uh, wet dreams, they're changing body. And I remember also speaking to a group of year six boys on this topic. And they were fascinated when I started talking and explaining to them about the pe periods, that girls get periods. The boys were so sensitive to it. And, they, and one boy said, well, what do we do if we find out if one of the, the girls in our class has a period? I said, that's a wonderful question. And he says, should we help them? Should we, you know, support them? Should we not talk to them? You know, all the, and, and it was not that they were anti it. They just were, were curious on how to support their fellow colleagues and their peers if that was to happen. Because they were going, oh, that sounds terrible. Because they started talking about cramping and, and how uncomfortable and the mood swings that happen. And, and uh, they were very sympathetic. And so I think we need to talk about these things to prepare our kids for the changes. I love that verse in Psalm 139, and many of you have heard it. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. How does it get in there, mum? How does the baby get in there? Well, again, using the right language is unfortunately can get ourselves into a lot of trouble because, and you'll hear this time and time again, because I remember hearing of a four-year-old girl who freaked out every time she saw a pregnant woman. And the mother couldn't quite work out why her daughter at the age of four freaked out every time she saw a pregnant woman. It's because she got told 
that the baby is in that mummy's tummy. So she thinks that these women have eaten all the babies and it's in the mummy's tummy. Simple language. You think you're giving them the right answer, but unfortunately it can be put through their own processes, cognitive processes at their age level. And so the language that they use and talking about there's a special part in a mum, in, a, in a, whim, a woman called the uterus. And that uterus is where the baby grows. It's not the stomach and not the tummy. And so again, we use proper language, penis, vagina. I remember when my uh, son was about two or three years of age and saw my wife coming out of a shower and he pointed and goes, ouch. Because it was the first time he saw the difference between a daddy and a mummy. These things, we shouldn't freak out. We shouldn't be embarrassed about it but we need to be prepared to have these conversations because they could be shocked, they could be embarrassed, they could be disgusted, oh no, they could be quite shy. Other kids would be very curious and very excited about the conversation. It's amazing when you start talking about boys about this stuff, you'll have a few boys leaning in a little bit more and, uh, and other kids will be just completely confused because they may have been misinformed by their siblings, maybe misinformed about different language. And, and, and that's the reason why mum and dad need to be on the same page. But we want them to be curious. And even just to talk about puberty in a general way is that, you know, understand that it can happen any, any age between about the ages of eight and 17, mostly around 10 to 12 or 13, 14 years of age. Some people start a little bit earlier. Some people, it takes a little bit a while to develop. And I've got a friend of mine who's got a son who's 24 and he's never grown any pubic hair. It's just one of those things. So there is an abnormality there, but had they not had this conversation, he would think that he's a, he's a freak and, and it's not very helpful. So we need to start talking about when their body starts to change. You know, they're going to grow taller, their bones are going to get bigger and become heavier, their face changes, they'll get more sweaty, they might get pimples and understanding that. Uh, their hair is going to grow in unusual parts. And I remember I was talking to a group of grade five boys and it was a mixed class about puberty. They wanted to do a, a mixed class, which was, was fine by me when I was talking about it. I don't get embarrassed about that. I think being a nurse for so many years helps me, you know, so I don't get embarrassed. But a little, and I started talking about hair and this little boy puts his hand up. And I said, yes. He goes, I've got hair, I've got hair down there. I've got it, I've got it there. And so there's an appropriateness of what we can say in a public setting, but all the other kids are going, oh no. Other girls were laughing at him. The boys were laughing at him, but you know, it was just, we shouldn't be embarrassed about it. And he was just matter of fact that he's he started growing uh, his pubic hair. The in, internal and external organs will start to grow and, uh, and develop. And, and that's one thing you have to be very mindful of is, is explaining the differences because there's going to be one kid in the class that's going to be a bit bigger. I, I know when I took my boys swimming, they were very embarrassed and they had the towel around them. And that happens in girls uh, change rooms as well. But then you'll also, they'll compare and contrast. You know, why is their penis bigger than mine? Why are their breasts bigger than mine? You know, all of these things uh, are going to uh, confuse them and you need to have this conversation to them. But one thing you need to really be mindful of is the mood swings. We'll talk about that in a few moments. But just the difference between boys and girls, their voice is going to change, their hairs are going to change, uh, the penis and the scrotum uh, and testicles will change. And, and using language they understand, um, they might start having fe feelings or thoughts about sex. Um, their hormone, the main driver is testosterone and they're going to get muscles and they're going to start. And as I said before, they might have wet dreams and have erections. And, and boys are very proud of their erections. And that's something that we need to be very mindful of and keep that private. But we shouldn't be embarrassed about it either. And they might start feeling it. And if you say something like, I'll put it away. Or, you know, like, and, and you overreact, they're going to feel more guilt and shame. It's just one of those things. And you say, well, that's, a, that's nice. Just put it away and, and that's private. And again, just the way that you communicate this will, will be the way that they respond. Girls uh, and uh, going through this uh, and in a way that they're going to get hairs and they're going to start uh, developing breasts and nipples. And it's not unfortunate. It's not uh, untoward that one breast will develop faster and it may look a bit uneven. Majority will actually um, become more uh, symmetrical, but even just letting them know that one breast may develop further. There might be some um, pain in their nipples. Again, 
This is something, just a conversation. It's not matter, it's a matter of fact. The less embarrassed you are, you might be freaking out on the inside, but the more comfortable you are, the more comfortable they will be to ask questions. They may have some sexual thoughts and feelings and probably girls will have them more than boys. Um, their main sexual hormone is estrogen. And then you can start talking about how the, every month they'll release an, an ovum and an egg and it's released um, and, it, and it embeds in the lining of the uterus. And then every, if it's not fertilized, when a, a sperm will get in there and if it's not fertilized, it will shed the lining of the uterus and then you'll have a monthly cycle. Painless, matter of fact, factual, on, honest and open. And I have to say, just put a little, little sub note here. I would encourage you, if you've got a daughter, is to actually have a little bit of emergency pack that they can have in their school bag just in case it happens to them. And most schools are very good about this anyway. I mentioned about mood swings, those times when they feel like, oh, I'm on top of the world, and other times when they feel, oh no, I'm hopeless, I can't do anything, and they might start being laughing, <laughs> and then other times they are crying and they're vague, and you know, sometimes we might be disciplining them because of their vagueness, but it's something that is out of their control, simply because they're going through adolescence. And they might feel very confident one day, very sexy, and then feeling very fearful and, and alone and scared. And, and we need to help navigate this. And, and, and actually, when things are going well, it's a good opportunity to have these conversations because there's going to be a time when it's going to be a bit of a nightmare. And the more comfortable you're going to be, hey, remember when we said that you might get a bit moody? Yeah, well, now you are a bit moody. I encourage you just to remove yourself because they might say something or do something that they will later regret. These things I'm just saying that we have to talk about. And we live in, as I said, in a highly sexualized world. And we need to talk about how to have these conversations. On our website, as I said, we've got a downloadable resource on how to talk to your kids about sex. And we cover a lot of these things and I'm trying to do a lot in a short period of time. But one of the things that we have to be very mindful of is, you know, we can talk about um, sex and it can be an uncomfortable word or, or an embarrassing word and because we weren't given that conversation and we muddled our way through it but we need to help our kids explain what sex is all about and it doesn't mean if you talk about it, it means that they're gonna go out and do it in fact they'll be better informed and have an understanding of what sexuality really is and this is the challenge that we have in our highly sexualized world as I said that there's different voices and they assume that everyone's doing it. And we also assume that to fit into the crowd, we have to do this. That's not necessarily the case. And one case in, in particular is in the area of pornography. The data is actually saying about 100% of boys by the age of 12 will have viewed pornography. And I know there's some parents saying, not my child, that could never happen to me. That my child will never do that. They're, they're a very good child, even good kids, can do things. And, and obviously there's a lot of different things. They might have looked at it accidentally. It just could have happened there. Their friends, as I said, it happened to my one of my sons. They might have been curious. They heard about it and they, and they want to be educated. And that's where a lot of learning happens. And that's where we see a lot of violence and a lot of um, degrading of women takes place. And, and they can't disconnect because it appears on the virtual that this is normal and girls seem to like it. And even girls, and we're seeing an increasing number of people becoming an addicted or habitually looking at pornography at a younger and younger an age. I've got a friend of mine who's a child psychologist, and he's actually, one of his clients at the moment is an eight-year-old boy who is actually habitually looking at pornography and trying to break that habit. So it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And I don't say this to scare you, I say that this is the reality. And I would say, and the data was actually saying about 30% of habitual viewers of pornography seeking professional help are now women. So it's not just a young person's issue and it's not just a guy's person, a guy's issue. We're seeing women and we're seeing at various ages looking at pornography because it makes them feel good. Uh, they can justify it and uh, because, you know, they might think it's, it, I can be rewarded. I can, it, it's a form of release. Um, I'm just watching sex, I'm not going to get it, I'm not going to do it. And so they can't get pregnant and they can't get an STD. Um, 
it's done in a way that is um, quite private because the majority, the majority of pornography is viewed on technology. And the data is changing and it's up to about 85 to 90% of all pornography is viewed on a smartphone. And many of the questions that I've had in the past about technology, when can my child get a smartphone? Well, I would say if they can't control a, their tablet and they can't control uh, a laptop, I would never give my child a smartphone because they, have given, they haven't given uh, me any evidence to trust them because as soon as you give them that phone, you're giving them incredible temptation. The new way of communicating and showing that you like them is through sexting, and I'll talk about that later on. And sometimes it's just sort of saying, oh, it won't happen to me because I've got it under control. But you don't know. It's a bit of like Russian roulette. You have no idea if your children will become addicted or habitually viewing this pornography. But it sends off this uh, chemical reactions in their brain. They may self-soothe or masturbate to the images and this becomes more of a gravitational pull that they have to do it more frequently and then it degrades to more violent or more um, obscure different things and what starts off with very innocent and looking at just nakedness they have to become more violent and again I say this not to scare you or frighten you this is the reality that many people are faced with that they may have started off thinking it won't happen to me but it will eventually wear them down and it becomes more and more of a problem and it changes their way of looking at that and I, and I could speak to a group of um, 12 year old boys and I could guarantee if I spent any no, enough time with them and asked the right questions I could actually start discerning who was looking at it and who was not looking at it by sheer how aggressive they become or more agitated and I'm not saying that if your child becomes more agitated or more aggressive they are looking at pornography but it could explain why that is the case. It changes, people who look at pornography, changes their value systems, their beliefs, their behaviors, their thinking, everything is affected by that. And you are not setting them up for success later on in life if you have not put it in place early on. All of this to say, you have to have these conversations. And I said before, learn to respond, not react. So a question that you might like to ask your child is, have you ever seen any images of naked people who made you on, on the internet that popped up on the screen and made you feel a bit uncomfortable or made you feel excited? And they could respond one of two ways. Oh, no way, mum. No way, dad. No, I, I've never seen that. I've, that's never happened to me. No, 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 no. Protested too much. <laughs> well, you say, well, if that's the case, that's okay. But I went to a seminar just recently and they spoke about this and and I want you to know that if you see something on the internet, I want you to feel comfortable to come and tell me. Because you might have some questions. Again, remembering, learning to respond, not react. And the more comfortable that they go, oh, well, now that you mention it, mum or dad, um, yeah, I have seen it once, uh, maybe twice, no, three times, that's it, no more. Again, you want them to feel comfortable with you because it will, if they don't, they'll hide it from you even further and further away and it could become a, a bigger issue. And we have to have external filters and if you don't have those things, you can, it, your internet provider can provide some filters there. There are some great websites or great apps you can purchase and I can send those to you if you would like to know them. But the most important filter is to encourage your child to have an internal filter to divert their eyes if they see it. And my boys now, even when they see something on the news or, or seeing something on a, a, a media platform that is inappropriate, they'll divert their eyes. They, they realize that they need to protect themselves. Because all of my boys, despite our best efforts, have all been exposed to pornography. And we had to navigate that with them. And here's someone who's proactive in the space and it became an issue. And we started talking about it, but we didn't you know, you know, balk at the, the challenge, but we said, will walk you through this. And I occasionally, uh, on, on semi-occasionally, when I found out early, I was checking on them on a regular basis, but then it became every now and then, how are you going in that area? You know, what's been going on in your world? You know, what's, what, is that a big issue? And, and I'm like, oh, I'm going really well, Dad. I'm doing really, really well. I'm, I'm really proud of you. Well done. 
but I want you to know that you can come and talk to me if you've got a problem. Because you rather than they come to you with this problem before it is too late. I mentioned this verse before when it says in Romans, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You want them to control their mind. And their mind is being controlled by their eyes and their ears and what they allow in there, those internal filters. The patterns of this world are saying it's normalized, it's okay, it's only just images, it's not real, it's not virtual, but you don't know this disconnect. They think this is real, but it is a virtual world. And the more that they get uh, filtered into their mind, and, and you want them to be filters rather than sponges, but the more they get into their mind, the more they need to feed the beast, so to speak. And so a conversation now and ongoing will be the best thing you can give to your children because you want to set them up for success. You don't want them to go into marriage. And as I said, it's not just a guy's issue, it's also a girl's issue. You don't want them to go into their marriage and actually say to their partner who they've chosen for the rest of their life, um, you know, I've got a porn problem. But it's okay, I've got it under control. And now that we're, we're married, we can have sex all the time. And everyone knows that is not the case. But they think that once they can actually physically do it, they won't have a problem. But I hear so many times that the problem they had in their early formative years will continue to follow them later on. And it causes a disconnect. It causes a lot of heartache. Intimacy is never, ever reached in their relationship. And it causes so many marital problems. So that's the reason why we need to talk about this. But one of the things that is very mindful of is this word called sexting. It has become the norm. And a lot of the data is actually saying, uh, I read one report that's saying about 60% of girls are solicited to send naked pictures of themselves. And boys are usually the ones, but we're actually seeing that reverse now. And more and more, more boys are being solicited to send images of themselves. It's a frightening world. And this is a way that kids communicate with one another. Instead of sending a, a little note, they say, I really like you. So I'll send you a naked picture. And they may not necessarily be, you know, physically able, ready to be, or relationally or, or cognitively processing, but this is the normalization through the power of platforms that they show images of themselves. They will justify it by saying, well, I'm not having sex, I can't get pregnant, I can't get an STI. They may be pressured by their peers. They may be curious about you know, what type of reaction they might get, but they don't see the consequences. And there's actually a relational and emotional consequence and a psychological one, but there's also a legal one. And every state is different. And I would encourage you to be as well informed because schools are having to get involved in this and it becomes a blurry line that children share these images. They may not have shared their face, but once you send something, again, your child is still developing and part of their brain is called the prefrontal cortex, the front of the brain where it thinks rationally and thinks cognitively, thinks through the consequences of choices, is still developing. It takes about 25 years or more for a brain to develop fully. So the next time your child uh, is doing something and you say, what were you thinking? They could actually answer you with, Oh, well, actually, it's my prefrontal cortex, mum and dad. It's not quite functioning at the moment, but it's getting there. Be patient with me. It's, that's science. But as they are going through the motions of not thinking through the consequences, they haven't thought about where this digital image will go and where it will end up. Where, um, if the person is really, oh, this is my true love, and he or she will never pass it on to somebody else. But then we actually hear of revenge porn. And a lot of the legal uh, lawmakers are actually paying catch up with this. And we have this revenge porn where someone actually voluntarily sent an image to somebody else. They break up and they use it as blackmail or they pass it on to somebody else. And the detrimental and the emotional and the relational consequences are devastating. So much so that people, uh, young people are having mental health issues and stress and anxiety and depression, all because they thought this person they loved, and I'll put it in inverted commas, someone they trusted has broken that trust and sent it through. So a conversation you could have with your children is actually, again, remaining, remembering to respond, not react. Has anyone ever asked you to send a naked picture or a semi-naked picture of you? 
they can respond of one of two ways. No way. No way. I can't believe you're asking me that, Dad or Mum. I can't believe you just asked me that question. Well, that's good. Follow it up with another question. Well, what would you do if someone does? I'll tell them where to go and they can, you know, take a hike. And you say, that's my girl. Yeah, <laughs> well done. Alternatively, they may have asked this answer with, well, actually, yes, they have. Now, again, respond, not react. Um, well, what did you do? Well, I, I was really reluctant and I didn't, I, I didn't do it for a long time. But eventually, I, I just sent them a quick snap, a side, a side view, or I sent them just a little bit. They, you couldn't tell it was me. And then again, the way that you respond at this time will dictate whether they will tell you anything in the future. So you might actually have to say, and there may be some other consequences of this to follow up, but they are the victim as well as part of this culture conforming to the patterns of this world. And so you need to uh, you know, handle this delicately in a way that they won't freak out, but they might have sent an image to somebody else. And I want to know if, if you as a parent, you would want to know if that was the case. And so we as parents need to confide and not look at them as being a pervert or being you know, silly or ignorant. They are ignorant. They are. And they are naive. They don't realize the consequences of their actions. It's not their fault. It's just the development of their brain. And it might seem like a ridiculous thing to do, but because peer pressure and popular culture is driving them, and that is the reason why, mum and dad, you need to have these conversations with them as often as possible, ongoing, and encourage them to ask questions because you want them to talk to you. I saw this quote, the greatest enemy of sexual health is silence, which means not talking about it doesn't mean the problem's going to go away. It means that you need to fully delve in, get out of your comfort zone and talk to your kids about this because we want to encourage our kids. And this wonderful poster I saw, purity precedes true intimacy. And that's ultimately what you want for your children. You want them to have true intimacy. And the only way they're going to have that is if they keep their minds and their bodies as protected as possible. And you sell the reasons why. God has orchestrated and he, he thinks that sex is a wonderful idea because it was his idea in, in the first place. Yes, it is for procreation, but it's for pleasure. And it actually draws two people together. And it's not just a physical thing to do. There's also an emotional connection. And we want to set you up for true intimacy because every time you are physically intimate with another human being, it picks up baggage. You, it carries you all along. And if you have you know, multiple sexual partners or multiple sexual experiences, you will take that into the next relationship. Now, it doesn't mean if they have made a mistake, it is, you know, they're you know, forever going to be tainted with it. They can actually know, and I talk about that with when I speak to students about this, talking about having a spirit of virginity and starting afresh, starting anew. And all of that to say is that you want to set your children up for success. And in a culture where a lot more people are, you know, are cohabiting, this is the normal in our culture today. We're seeing about 90% of couples choose to live together before they get married. We see that about... Um, you know, about 95% of couples are, are sleeping together. There's only a smaller number. This is what's happening in our culture, unfortunately, because they haven't given a healthy alternative. But the evidence points to if they can, can, can um, commit to abstinence before they get married and they go into marriage, the relationship is stronger, the sexual experience is better and healthier, especially if the other both parties are have got the same journey. And it is a, a big part of this world that we live in that so many people are saying, well, it's just sex. But we've even seen Hollywood change when we see movies like um, No Strings Attached or uh, Friends with Benefits. These movies, Hollywood movies, they just simply have a physical interaction. But then they, you find throughout the movie, they form a bond and relational connection. So you can't just have physical. I mean, animals do it just physically for procreation. There's not that bond together. Humans have this incredible privilege to have that pleasure and having that ongoing commitment. And that commitment brings two people close 
together. We at Focus on the Family are committed to help you and your family thrive. And you can go to our website at families.org.au and you can download a free resource called Talking to Your Kids About Sex. It's got a whole lot of different resources about puberty, um, sexting, uh, pornography, and including LGBT. And while you're there, you can download another resource called Talking to Your Kids About Alcohol and Drugs. And these have only been made possible through the generosity of people like you who support the work of this ministry. So consider if this has been a blessing to you so you can be a blessing to us so we can continue to be a blessing to hundreds and thousands of other people across this great nation. God bless and thank you for joining us. Thank <laughs> you.